time. Thank you, thank you very much for giving me your time today. Thank you, Rachel, for setting this up. Uh, my name is Jack David. I'm a patent attorney, although I'm well versed in the other forms of intellectual property. My firm is uh, Alan Dyer, Duff, and Gilchrist. We uh, are a full service intellectual property boutique, which is just you know advertising, marketing, jargon for we do everything. We do copyrights, trademarks, litigation, trade secrets, all those little things. And so I'm going to try to today give you guys kind of a brief primer and then why you should care about each one of the divisions of intellectual property, and then kind of like a very short, this is how you actually get protection. You know, that was something I think Rachel would asked me to concentrate on. So, so four types of IP, you've probably heard about all of them. Well, maybe not trade secrets, but uh, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, and patents. Uh, copyright. Copyright is probably the most, one, the most familiar one people are like, seeing, which is, Provides protection for a creative works, fixed and tangible medium of expression, literary works, music, film, architecture, sculptures, all sorts of stuff. Code. It has to be original expression. Yeah, and an original expression means it just can't be redundant. It can't be some type of, you know, something that has, doesn't have much creativity and expression into it. What's neat about copyright is that it's you know gives you a bundle of rights. Uh, at least that's the way we used to talk about rights in law school, but you got reproduction rights, you can't make copies, creating derivative works, distributing copies, performing performing or displaying the work publicly, and that includes digital audio transmission. Uh, duration, 70 years plus life, corporate authors, earlier 95 to 120 years uh, from creation, and the steamboat oily really one I always like to talk about expires in 2023, but it keeps getting extended. So. Copyright originally in the early 1900s was 50 years in duration. Then it got extended to 70 years. Then it got extended to this, 95. And the reason being, Steamboat Willie, the original iteration of Mickey Mouse, was coming up to go into the open domain. And if you go back, if it goes into the open domain, that means you can start doing derivative works of it, which means you could do all sorts of uh, Things that might uh, make the house of Mickey very unhappy about their mark, or their, their property, excuse me. So every, every time it comes up for expiration, they lobby very hard and vigorously, and no one really opposes it until it gets extended. You know? So ownership for copyright is usually the creator, but it depends. Uh, if, it's, if, if it's an employment situation, it actually the, the uh, the author of it, well, let me step back. So in copyright law, there's a person who creates it, and there's the author who owns it, which can be separate, oddly enough. And the uh, employment circumstance, your employer is the author and would own it. You're on your own, freelancing, it's you, it's you the creator. Uh, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. Again, I'm trying to hustle the, uh, the, the, address, the address the employee versus an independent contractor issue. But basically, this is some of the pitfalls people fall into when it comes to copyright, which I was getting to. So how? So how do you get copyright protection for your businesses? So it's pretty fair, it's automatic. I mean, the right exists the second you fix it in a tangible medium. You don't need to go anywhere and have someone like bless your, uh, your, your artistic expression. You got copyright rights the second you're done with it. And you can register with the copyright office and we recommend it because there's several advantages largely leading to a you know, public record of the copyright claim. It's necessary before you can file a federal lawsuit for copyright <coughs> infringement. There's a presumption of validity that's helpful. And you get statutory damages, which are awesome, I'm just going to say. Yeah. So why should, you, why should you care about copyrights? It depends. You know, they're assets, albeit intangible, and they're very valuable for businesses. I mean, for example, back to Disney, they uh, purchased Lucasfilm largely for the copyright, and most importantly, the copyright right of derivative works based on uh, George Lucas's works. So that's how you do the new trilogy, you do the part, you Galaxy's Edge, you can do all sorts of stuff because you own the copyright now. And hence the reason why they're so worried about Steamboat Willie going into the public domain is you can do a derivative work of that now. Uh, so if you're in the content creation business, it's very important. So if you're a website designer or you're designing any type, any type of content, whether it's coding, website design, 3D rendering, anytime you are doing any type of content creation, blogging, writing articles, 
Copyright is basically going to be your bread and butter. That's going to be the intellectual property of your business that you need to protect. And again, there's very few limits on transferability. You can basically be sold as far as an asset sale, like what happened with this bill. Can be acquired when the parent entity is acquired. These things, they're great because again, they add value to your business. Because you know, people have business models and they're like, well, what's your business model? Well, I'm going to make millions in this model or try to have someone buy me for millions. And, Having copyright and having those rights perfected is an asset that sits in your company. So when someone looks at your company, they know what they're purchasing. So, of course, you can use them for offensive use. They can be used as weapons in court, copyright infringement. Massive source of licensing revenue, of course. Statutory damages, which are just formal uh, codified damages. And they're in, the, they're in the federal code. They were lobbied by the content creators. Uh, you know, the, the Disney's of the world, the Universal's of the world, they basically lobby Congress to put in statutory damages. And why? Because typically your damages are actually connected to the damage you caused. It was caused onto you. With statutory damages, you don't have that anymore. Now you just go to the statute, and they're, and they're substantial. And you know, this might be before your time. Do you guys remember when they were, the MPAA was suing uh, people for file sharing on the uh, file sharing of music, digital musical files? And the old grandmother would get tagged with an $800,000 infringement uh, damages. That was all on statutory damages. It's usually like $4,000. Don't quote me on this, but it's $4,000 in infringement. So for every song they could prove that was on the de that was illegally copied on that that on that hard drive, four grand to pop. Rachel. Um. So just as a, another example of where you Jerry Seinfeld gets a residual <coughs> check for every time that Seinfeld episode is played and reruns. This, and the, the, re, the residuals are, can be amazing sometimes, depending on how long that run can be. And there are wonderful things to have of the copyrights. I mean, they're just, again, they, they, for content creators, and unfortunately, you know, it's easy to run foul of these things sometimes. Uh, monetary, okay, I guess, not to get, I, I guess I'm a little concerned about time, so. How, what are what is our time today, by the way? Until one-ish or so. Oh, plenty of time. All right, let's slow down. <laughs> monetary damages. So, it is, so typically all the statutory damages are monetary. But if you got a judgment-proof uh, defendant, like you got some website operator who's just doing it for the heck of it, you know, uh, and you can actually get jail time for certain forms of copyright infringement. I know it's like it's legit. I mean, you can basically you actually take a look at copyright law. Copyright law. It's quite clearly that it's been uh, there's strong lobbying efforts to increase the enforceability of copyright infringement, and it's because the content creators are so well, they're wealthy and they're powerful and they have lots of lobbyists, and no one's ever going to fight. You know, no one's going to no one's going to protest a copyright term extension or copyright att attaching criminal penalties to copyright infringement. No one's, that's not going to get anyone uh, uh, their blood boiling. So it just happens, you know. And like the extension will likely happen again. Steve but Willie will likely not go back into the public domain. They're just going to wait into the appropriate moment, and then the extension will appear, and Congress will take it up, and they will pass it because who, who doesn't like lobbying money? 
So common pitfalls. This is more cut for, and this is again for Pete folks, you know, you know, as you're starting your business, here are the common problems we have, I've seen. Uh, improper registration with the copyright office. You don't have to register, there is a benefit. I recommend you hire an attorney to do it. It's not expensive, but it's, it's sometimes improper registration would be an issue. Ownership could be listing the wrong owner, failure to hammer out ownership of the copyright material. Well, of course it's our business, it's ours. So it's like, well, is it an employee? Well, yeah, no, he's kind of a freelance contractor. We got him on a fiber, right? And uh, is, there a, is there a contract in place regarding that work for hire? If it's not there, it belongs to him, not you. So it could be a, there's, a, there's a certain standard for contractors that you have to meet to have that, that, those rights transferred to you. So if you've got, you got a bunch of web devs working for you, you want to make sure they're all under contract. Uh, inadvertent infringement of another party's copyright material. This happens all the time. You'll get a letter from Getty or from you know, some other copyright holder, and like, hey, we just noticed your website has a picture of the Statue of Liberty, and that belongs to us. That image is a copyrighted image. You didn't get a license, so you're you're subject to potentially statutory damages up to four thousand dollars, and we're going to pursue it. But you can buy a license right now for five hundred dollars, and people pay the five hundred dollars because they don't want to fight it. Because it is, I mean, they'll take it to an attorney and they'll tell you, yeah, that's legit. Did you have a license to use that image? No, you did not. That's infringement. They could potentially sue you and get statutory damages, unlikely to do it, and then people pay the $500. It's a great money maker for Getty. And Getty's like that, the clearinghouse for all those images you see. Uh, AP is another one. Uh, so this brings us into trademarks. So trademarks are really different. People conflate trademarks with copyrights and patents all the time. But trademarks really don't protect technology. They don't protect so much an expression of a creative expression of art. They protect identification. It's all about source identification. Where does the product come from? Where does the service come from? You see certain logos, and we'll all know we identify certain uh, cer certain companies. You see the UCF logo, you know it's the UCF. You see that. The logo up there, you see the Golden Knight, and you immediately know, all right, the University of Central Florida fil affiliated uh, event. If you see that on anything, you immediately will associate with the University of Central Florida. And that's literally a mark. That is a tra uh, it is probably a registered trademark, I'm assuming. Uh, and how do you get a trademark? So we'll give you some examples. How about the Disney one, and the Nike one. It isn't my favorite one. It's Everyone recognize this one? Yeah, I know, right? This is nuts. It, it's such a good mark. It's like the best mark. And they have like, they have trademarked it's not out of this thing. So they trademark, you can trademark color. They, that Tiffany blue has been trademarked. You can trademark the box. They, they call it trade dress at that point. The box and the, uh, the box plus color plus the bow has been trademarked. And if you try to sell those Tiffany uh, boxes on like Etsy or eBay, Tiffany is uh, very aggressive about trying to knock those down because you are not Tiffany. You can't put our mark on your product. You know, so they all, they're always very aggressive about protecting it. So that same thing with Coca-Cola, Nike. I mean, if you put a swoosh on your product and you were out there, people are going to think it's a Nike product. So Nike is going to show up and utilize their trademark rights to, uh, to, get, to stop you from doing those actions. Now, why do we have trademarks? You know, copyright, we want to protect artistic expression. Trademarks is all about efficiency. We've decided as a, as a country that it's economically efficient to allow people like Coca-Cola and Nike to develop these marks so we can know it's from the, this particular supplier and protect those marks and not allow people to basically uh, infringe on their trademarks. Because you know, it'd be frustrating if you went and got a Coca-Cola, expect it to be a Coca-Cola, it looks like a Coca-Cola and it's a knockoff. You know, you'd be, you'd just wasted, you just bought that product thinking it was a Coca-Cola, it really wasn't. And so we've decided as a society we're going to we're going to try to avoid those wasteful transactions with trademarks. So the spectrum of protectability, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty common sense. The more arbitrary and fanciful your your mark is, uh, uh, the more it readily can be protected. But what I'm basically saying is you can't mark some get a trademark on something that's descriptive of your product because then you're limiting free speech because then people can't describe the product. So we wanted to, like, for example, Xerox was a great one. It has absolutely nothing to do with what they do. Document production. Made up work. You, you know, 
Unfortunately, you know, it became more generic as I became ubiquitous, and that's a whole other thing we can talk about. But the more generic and descriptive the market is, the more difficult it is to get protection. So how do you do it? There's actually, just like copyright, you don't actually have to do anything. Once you put your mark on your product and you put it out in commerce, you have what are called common law rights. They're not very good and they're quite limited, but you have some rights. You want to register them, uh, preferably with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, but you also can register them with state bodies and here in Florida, the Florida Department of State. And again, it's limited to this jurisdiction. So why should you care as a business? I mean, problem with trademarks, if your business isn't popular or successful, they're not really that valuable because there's not that much goodwill. But if you become more successful and your business grows, like these food trucks, right? They're super popular now. When they were first coming out, the ones that are really good, people tried to copy them. Like, I want to get the same color. I'm going to have a similar name. They're basically trying to steal the goodwill like a food truck had developed, you know, unfairly steal that goodwill by trying to make people confused. And that's what trademarks uh, are there to protect, the likelihood of confusion of the customer. I go to the food truck, I think it's the, it's the food truck, the, you know, the Korean barbecue food truck that I've gone to for years. It looks the same, it says Korean barbecue on it, and it's not. And so, you know, so what ends up happening is, you know, and this is the reason why you do want to protect it. Alright, some transferability. The problem with trademarks is they're not like copyrights and patents where you can just sell them and move them along. Because they're source identifiers, you can't just license them because you've damaged your trademark. So you have to be careful about who you allow to use your trademark. Like for example, franchise arrangements. If you were to open up a McDonald's, your franchise agreement is like 50 pages long because everything from the look and feel of your store to the lighting to what the logo on, you're going to get their cups, it has to be controlled, very consistent because they want to protect the marks, the very popular marks that McDonald's has. Again, you know, can be acquired, but you can't acquire a company, of course. When you buy the company, you do acquire the trademarks. You just have to be very careful about how you utilize them from that point forward. Of course, you use them as weapons of court. Oh, this is the neat thing. So, use them as weapons of court, of course. If you got a trench to trademark on a product and people are knocking off your product, you actually get customs to seize the stuff, counterfeit stuff as it comes in. And when I say counterfeit, I'm not talking real knockoffs. I mean, it could just have, for example, it's had a client of mine. They got the product shipped in from China. It had the hook and loop interface, which I don't know if everyone knows what that is. That's Velcro. Velcro is trademark. You can't call it a Velcro unless it's made by Velcro. Everyone, we, we all associate that as a Velcro, but that's technically not it. So they're trying to protect the mark. So they're very aggressive about that. So. I always say hook and loop interface, which is the technical term for what Velcro is. So my clients had the belt had a hook and loop interface on their product, and to identify it, literally it was a little word on it on the on the box of like ten thousand that said Velcro. They seized it. They seized it. The customs actually seized it because it had the Velcro mark on it. it. Wasn't even on the packaging of the product. It was on the big box that ten thousand were in, just to identify which one it was. They had two. They had two versions. So now we're at the whim of Velcro begging them. They're like, hey, we're, we're going to take that off the product, you know, because it's not a Velcro, it's not a Velcro official Velcro hook and loop interface. So it's neat. I mean, it's really neat. I mean, and again, they do it automatically. Like they see that they saw Velcro and the customs agent sees them. And, and then you, so it's really neat if you can do that. So common pitfalls, improper registration. I call trademarks almost professional form billing because people will pro se these things all the time. When I say pro se, doing it without representation, I'm not sure. In case you're not familiar with the term. But people will do it because they're like, oh, you're just filling out a form. It's like, yeah, actually, that's pretty much what trademark registration can be. But I call it professional form billing because it is just nuts. Like, you can foul it up in so many different ways. And people do it all the time. Or they don't register, they wait, and then another mark owner actually enters the uh, enters into the market, and you can no longer own that right exclusively. Unlicensed use of the mark leading to infringement issues, of course, sometimes seizure by customs. That's the same I was talking about. Uh, trade secrets. So trade secrets are kind of cool. I mean, they are what they are. They are basically confidential, confidential know-how, negative know-how client list, customer list, how you do things that you're internal to your business. Uh, great examples, Colonel's secret recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken, Coca-Cola formula, 
Google search ranking algorithm. They never want these things to see the light of day. And so they protect them. And everyone who has access to them uh, are under confidentiality agreements, and they are secure access to these things. And so what do you do for your business? You need to take reasonable steps to make sure if you have trade secrets like client lists, you got to limit the people who have access to it, the people who do have access to it, you need to present them with confidentiality agreements, non-competes. Everything needs to be more confidential if it is confidential. Because the last thing, because what ends up happening, you know, is that your, your former employee, your business starts to grow, your former employee thinks, well, why do I need to stay here? I can just go create the same business down the street, take the client list, and start competing with you right away, and that's what invariably happens. So, again, you want to protect the secret sauce of your business, and in combination with a non-compete, great hedge against rogue former employees. So, does anyone, does it, did anyone keep up with the Waymo Uber lawsuit from last year? So this one was nuts. So this guy was the head of the autonomous driving division for Waymo, which is a subdivision of uh, Google, or Alphabet Incorporated, whatever they call themselves nowadays. And he gets like a killer deal from Uber. And he's like, heck yeah, I'm gonna go launch your autonomous driving division. And so he walks into the office and he downloads like 250,000 files from the database at Google and then walks right out the door, sends out his resignation email, and goes straight over to Uber. He takes all that technical know-how with him. So basically, he had advanced to Uber almost a decade, allegedly, uh, uh, in the autonomous driving technology field. Variably, Google was unhappy with that result. Uh, and so they sued him for misappropriation of trade secrets, because of course he had signed a confidentiality agreement, so there was an employment contract in place, and it's really neat. You can actually get criminal in certain states. So trade secret law is state-based. In California, for certain trade secret misappropriation, there's criminal penalties potentially available. And not just, not just the monetary. And when criminal comes in, people fold. Like, I mean, they fold, like, uh, they fold real quick. No one, no one wants to have that be, a, uh, be an issue. And of course, there was a Ring Pro alarm, which is the Amazon, the, uh, Amazon subdivision. And uh, I think it was ADT had the same issue where they basically sold the company in the parking lot and took the technology. And there was this whole dispute about whether it was a, they had sconded with the technology. And ADT actually got the Ring Pro alarm system delayed from entry to the market until they settled that. So, I mean, trade secrets are really valuable. I mean, I, I see the big, I've see, I see the, the big companies using them and using them quite aggressively nowadays. Because you can get all sorts of great remedies. I mean, that's the big thing, is what can you get? Are you going to get money? Are you going to get an injunction, like with Ring Pro? Uh, uh, or, you, or, you know, how will it make you Can you, you explain what an injunction is? Oh, so an injunction. So Ring Pro was ready to sell their system. But because of that misappropriation case, the judge ordered, uh, basically an injunction is an order from the federal court saying, no, you can't sell that. You know, and you have to obey uh, I mean, companies cannot, for persons, it's criminal penalty, you'll be held in contempt. For corporations, they'll just start fining you tremendous sums of money until the point gets made. So companies tend to comply. Injunctions, and that's why I was talking about remedies. What can you get? Like I tell folks all the time, they're like, oh, you gotta have an end game. If you ever gotta go to court, what are you gonna get? A pile of money, an injunction? Is it gonna be satisfactory? And that's one, it's actually something you, as a company, when you're deciding how to spend your resources, go and get a patent, go and do copyright protection. You have to think, like, what protection will this afford me? What, as an asset for the company, is it useful? If I have to assert it, can I? And so these are all the types of questions you have to ask when you're deciding what to do. Oh, pitfalls. Failure to paper up employees, man. If you get employees in, just even give them a non, give them an employment agreement, a non-compete. You know, make sure they sign all these things immediately. Does it end up happening? Because that question. Uh, well, I have a question about the companies that, um, for the companies being fined and everything. Mm -hmm. um, for the, and for the case of, you know, like Waymo and Uber, mm -hmm. the guy came over from Waymo with flash drive filled with their stuff, so Uber was probably aware that that stuff wasn't legally acquired when they accepted that information. What if it was something um, that the company receiving the trade secrets, like it was completely out of their control? Like say you're just sitting there and another company from a representative gets drunk and just starts spilling trade secrets. I think it depends on the state. That's a good question. So basically, you're saying, let's say someone at Pepsi 
gets an email and it's the formula for Coca Cola. Here you yeah. guys go. You know, they uh, didn't hire the guy or anything. It's just there. It's just <laughs> there. I don't. I still think you could. Uh, you would be able to protect that because I think it would be misappropriated if they started using it. Now, if it's Mark, it's a good question. That's a really fact specific question. And I'm actually interested. I'm gonna. What I want to do. I'm gonna. Hey, actually, I should have brought my cards, but did not. Uh, my email is the front. Uh, I'll give you my email after the presentation, and I will investigate that and try to get you an answer. That's actually a pretty interesting question. I do not know the answer to this. Thank you. Yeah. So, common pitfalls: failure to paper up employees, unenforceable NDAs, because NDAs sometimes can be so onerous that they're just illegal under state, certain state law. Like in Florida, you can't go any longer than two years, uh, or it's just going to be enforced. And sometimes they'll blue line them, which is they'll go through and kind of strike out the stuff that can't be enforced, but sometimes it just toss it right out. They're like, sorry, this, this clause kills your, kills your NDA. And again, NDAs and non-competes are state specific. Like California does not enforce non-competes. Florida does. So, huh? yeah, California does not enforce non-competes. Wow. Yeah, they've decided to do that, oh, which allows people like the Uber, the Waymo guy, that will walk right across the street and do that. That's part of the reason why Silicon Valley, because they, they poach, there was actually this big thing about a couple of years ago how Steve Jobs, who was it, Bill Gates, and like, uh, 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 and the, uh, the, CEO, the co-founder of Google had an unwritten agreement not to poach each other's employees and to keep, keep, uh, and to keep uh, wages low. And they ended up selling it, but there was these really disconcerting emails between Steve Jobs, Adobe CEO, and Google. It was like this little reply off between these CEOs because someone had poached someone else's chief of engineering and they were really upset about that. And Steve Jobs, I mean, if you want to read some interesting emails, Steve Jobs laid down the, lay down the law on the one guy. He's like, I, I think it was the Adobe CEO. And he's just basically. We're on this little reply all just but remember, I'm young and you're way down here. And you know, I think he made a I as I recall, he threatened he basically I'm gonna I'm gonna instruct my hiring department to start hiring all of your chief engineers. We're just gonna double their salaries. We'll all be all, all be Apple employees by the end of next week. So uh, I mean and again, this is all this is a collusion to basically depress wages, which is really unfortunate. But again, that's a whole nother thing. I could talk for an hour on that. Just, in and of itself. So we're in the past, which is actually kind of what I do. That's my specialty. So timing wise, all right, we're gonna hustle. You know. So there's three types of patents. Plant patents, pretty rare. You don't really need to know about them unless you're designing hybrids uh, of plants. Uh, design patents, which are for the visual, ornamental, ornamental characteristics. Those are fairly common. Utility patents, which are the most common type of patents. You know, which basically protect new, useful, process machine, article of manufacture composition. That's the most common patent out there by, by leaps and bounds. And there's what's called a provisional patent application, which is an informal utility patent application, which can be useful for startups because they're less costly. So uh, patent grants, a lot of people don't understand the idea of a patent grant, which is kind of, because it's, it's not very much, it's not intuitive. So most people think, well, I got a patent on, you know, a bottle of water or a pen, so uh, I can make this, I'm the one who can make it. Not exactly, a patent is a negative right. So you can have a patent on an invention, but you can't actually make, sell, or use it. You can stop other people from making, selling, and use it, using it. And that's the right you would, you, you would enforce in uh, enforcing federal court. So people would ask, they're like, what do you mean? I can't, you can, I can't make it? Like, sometimes, no. If you do an improvement patent, you take someone else's patented technology and you patent an improvement on it, you actually can't make, sell, or use your invention because you need rights from that other guy. And so that's when you would do a cross-licensing where you know, you have to have the rights to make the improvement, you have the rights to make the, uh, the, uh, the base invention, and you both can make the same thing. So, so, so basically, patents are, again, what we call a negative right. So it's not a license to make your invention. It's, it's basically a right to stop others. You gotta go to federal court to enforce it. Patent term is 20 years from the earliest priority date, which is your filing date, usually. And design are 14 years from grant date. Uh, okay, so it's the only right that really requires filing. Like, you can't get any informal patent rights. If you don't file a patent application, you will have no patent rights. 
and you have to file that patent prosecution application to issue it. So people file the patent and they're like, oh, it's patented, right? And they're like, no, it's patent pending. And all patent pending means is that there's a potential for patent rights. It doesn't even mean you have patent rights. So you gotta actually take it across the goal line. So I like to tell folks like, you know, patent pending is like receiving the kickoff and you ran it to the 30 yard line. You know, yeah, that's nice, or a 35 yard line. That's decent field position, but not points. You, 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 you got to score a touchdown. You got to get that pat, patent issued, or you got nothing. If you turn the ball over on downs, you haven't done. You haven't done anything. And of course, I got. I got to throw in those football uh, metaphors. Go UCF. <laughs> so, why are patents important? Well, if you are a tech-based business, uh, you know, for example, if you're like Lumar, the, the lidar company that came out of UCF, uh, pretty old. That is their bread and butter, is their technology. So they're filing, if you check their patent filings, they're filing all sorts of stuff because that is, as just like with a content creating company, it's all about copyright, technology based companies, Google, Lumar, Apple, they're all about patents. You know, they're filing thousands of patents. And they're great because, you know, they're assets, intangible, but they're totally great because you can leverage them. I've seen people you leverage them for security on loans. If you, need, if you take funding, like a lot of times if you take a investment banker money, they will, will take a security interest in the patent applications, hoping that, all right, if your company fails, we will take those patent applications back and we'll start up another, start, we'll spin it off into another startup with another team. So they're very much transferable. You can encumber them. Uh, you can do all, basically, they're almost like a piece of real property. You can pretty much do a lot of these patents. And of course, you can use them offensively combination of proper marking, which is that whole patented, patent pending thing. You know, they, they, they basically delineate your competitors what's going on. Like, hey, I got these rights. Be, understand, if you come anywhere near my patent invention, I'm gonna enforce them against you. It's just basically a, 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 a virtual fence post or a fence line around your invention. And of course, the source of licensing revenue. A lot of companies don't even make the products. You know, they're, they're the patent trolls that we, people have heard about. You know, they basically generate, or patent enforcement entities, excuse me, they generate all their revenue from licensing. They actually don't make the product. They just basically they buy patents as assets, throw it into their, uh, their uh, in, in, into, into the, the store, and they go, go grant licenses, and that's how they generate money. So common pitfalls, these are the things that happen all the time. Disclosure in all forms. Uh, so basically, how do you affect your patent rights? Well, you disclose it. You put it out there for the public to utilize. And that's actual disclosure. But there's all these uh, constructive acts that are considered disclosure, like offers for sale or license, even confidential ones. You have a confidential offer for sale of your technology in the United States that's considered a disclosure. Okay? And in the United States, you have public use, of course. Uh, you have one year to file a patent application or you surrender your rights to the public domain. In many foreign countries, you surrender your rights immediately. There is no grace period. So if you have technology, keep it confidential. Don't offer it for like any particular software. No offers to buy the software, license the software until you have a filing. Even if it's a provisional, the informal filing, get a filing date. That's important. And of course, pro se filing. You know, everyone, provisionals have no formal requirements, so you can actually a lot of people will file the provisionals on their own. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're very, very, very bad. And <laughs> never are they good, or great, unfortunately. And they really don't protect you because they're not, they're, there's not enough detail to establish a patent filing on those provisionals, unfortunately. So, oh, question! Yay! So, by the way, this is sort of copyright infringement. <laughs> uh, but, we have a fair use, educational use. You know, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> At least. So, are there any questions? Oh, gentlemen, yellow? Yeah, uh, going back to copyrights, uh, you had mentioned that, like, when uh, obviously Disney's copyrights for Steamo Willie are coming up, um, they'll lobby to extend them. What is the basis of the lobbying? Do they have to show that it's still a relevant copyright? Does someone else just have to say, sure? I mean. Uh, so basically, I mean, what is their public policy argument? Yeah, uh, they're, they're, you generally, 
I think they would say, like the NPAA say, oh, extending copyrights rewards of creators of original work, and that you know you're in, you're going to reduce copyright uh, infringement, you're going to reduce counterfeit. You know, we have a great property. If you allow, for example, Steamboat Willie to go into the public domain, you know, you're going to you're, you're the business. Our generous business is going to be harmed. You know, and that's going to be their argument that you know you should that we deserve longer protection. But the rules persuasive argument is probably going to be the giant bag of money that they bring into the, the meetings, which generally wins out. I mean, because, I mean, it's a win-win for the politician. I mean, they look at it as like, no one's going to care, no one's going to be upset, you know, except for like the Electronic Frontier uh, Foundation, you know, and people who are for uh, ad ad advocates of the public domain. You know, they're going to argue that, you know, Steamboat Willie should be out, eventually go to the public domain. I mean. For example, Disney utilizes the public domain all the time for their movies. Aladdin is based on the public domain. Cinderella, all these things are based on the public domain. You know, they, they basically took stories that were ancient, no longer had copyright protection, and they had a of work, and they make tons of money on that. And uh, you know, and so Disney has made billions off of the, uh, of the public domain. Shouldn't everyone else? That's the counter argument. And question: Could you then make a derivative off of their Aladdin? No, because it would be, uh, they, they have the derivative rights off of their derivation, I believe. I, but you could do a derivative, if Steamboat Willie goes in, you can do a derivative of Steamboat Willie, which I'm going to check that out. I believe that's the case, but, you know, I, I feel like my, my copyright tingling, uh, you know, spidey sense is tingling that might not be accurate on that statement. But let me check on that one. Your question is? I, I know you can't do um, a derivative work like based off Aladdin specifically, but you could do a derivative work off of what Aladdin was based off of, and that would be extremely similar. Yes. In like, fact, I think that the great example of that is the, uh, there is a Cinderella movie, the live action one. I don't believe it. it's a Disney movie because it's a derivative work of a public domain, mm -hmm. uh, a domain. So as long as it does it, and again, whether it's a derivative work or not, is a whole other question of the body of law. You know, well, how do you know if it's a derivative work of something subsequent to Steamboat Willie or Steamboat Willie? Uh, and I'm sure that's all going to be worked out. <coughs> question? Uh, is a scientific poster presentation considered a disclosure? Uh, if it's public, if it's made public. So if, like, uh, I'm going to Beauty Tech Expo in October, if I'm presenting a poster there, if I don't patent or anything before I present, do I lose the ability to patent and protect it? Uh, in most jurisdictions, yes. In the United States, you got one year. Like you go to a, you go to a show and you bring out the product, that's a disclosure. If you uh, publish a white paper, that's a disclosure. If it's available, disclosure is defined by public accessibility. So if it's in that UCF library database, and that's the only database it has uh, that has it, but any person from the street can walk into the UCF library and download it, it's considered a public disclosure. Now, how would anyone ever find that out? The USPTO will never know. I mean, if you don't know it, you won't disclose. You have to. You have to actually disclose your prior disclosures to the USPTO when you file your patent application. But let's say you didn't know it was available in the UC UCF database, and you get your patent application, you get you get a patent. What ends up happening is it only hurts you when it's valuable. You'll be in an infringement litigation where they will hire people who will find the, to find whether it was available publicly, and they will find out that oh, it's been in the UCF database since 2018. So. And that predates your filing by more than a year, or so no patent for you. No bill. I mean, it's amazing what people. It's amazing what you can find when you have money, lots of money. When you're motivated and you have lots of money, uh, people find all sorts of stuff. So I was told by a professor that those are actually protected, and that you can't go in like. So if I present a uh, presentation, nobody can copy it, and I can actually I can patent it still. Is that just because of the one year time frame? Or is that yeah. Still? Now, so you're going so you're going to a scientific pre uh, scientific conference. Yeah, tech expo. And. and can anyone walk in? No, you have to be uh, invited by the DOD. That's not probably not going to be disclosure, actually. Okay. That's, uh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. When you say I, when I thought you were talking about a text expo, like a like a, com a conference. Okay. No, it's it's private. It, it's kind of a sliding scale on that. What's considered public disclosure or not? There's a whole body of law based on that. How many people are in there? Are they all under non-disclosure agreements? Are you controlling the act? I mean, these are things that would be like hammered out if you were to litigate. You know, uh, down the line. Question? I'm sorry. 
So go back to copyright. You said uh, copyright like deals with codes. So what if you have like one company that's doing like coding one plus one equals two, but then another company doesn't copy that, but they get the same output. So they do like four divided by two. Mm. So it's a similar, a, not that simple, but kind of algorithm. Uh, yeah, they they produce the same like product at the end result, but it's not. So the copyright logic is odd. Same. So here's the interesting thing about copyright. So a patent, if you were to patent that, it doesn't matter how the other person dealt with it, got it. They could have independently derived it, completely isolated on another part of the world. If you have the patent on it and you predate their uh, their public disclosure, you own it and you can sue them for infringement. Now in copyright. Independent derivation, I believe, is a defense. Uh, now, and this is to the question, is, you have two things going on, on, on with your, your question. One is, uh, is one plus one equals two, two plus two equals four, is that a copy? Is it enough of a change to get over the original one? So that would be a question. And then the next question is, is it functional? Because you can't copyright functional algorithms. Now, like when you talk about code, Copyright protection on code is very limited. It's literally the source code that is protected. Uh, so you almost have to verbatim copy it. So the problem with copyright is you see a software suite that is just awesome and you want to copy it. You can go and have your team in isolation generate the entire code on, based on their own. And then it'll be generally different just because everyone codes it a little differently and it won't be copyrighted. Now, if it had been patented, you couldn't do that. And that's part of the reason why software is typically more apt for patent protection, it, although it is incredibly unpopular in the software community. Uh, patents are the best way for software. Question? Uh, tech, or tech transfer ownership, is that on a case-by-case -case basis with the university, or is there a general like guidelines to percentage of ownership? Oh, that's a really good question, and just as a full disclosure, I do work for the University of Central Florida and tech transfer, and they are such lovely folks. <laughs> if you have any questions, I highly recommend you go contact tech transfer. But the answer is, if you're utilizing university resources, <coughs> there's definitely going to be a question of ownership of whether the university owns it. And in those instances, uh, you know, I tell, I always tell the students, like, you know, go to your go tech transfer, you know, and they'll they'll look at it and they'll decide. And a lot of times they may not be interested in that type of technology and they'll sign a release. Even if they have a potential right for it, they might sign a release and let you go pursue it on your own. Or maybe they say, you know what, this is a UCF property and we're going to pay you to have the application pursued. So it really comes down to whether you're utilizing resources uh, uh, of the university and where you're doing the creation. And it's, a, again, a fact-specific instance. So I tell folks that, you know, if you have a question, you have to seek an attorney. Just not me, because I can't really help you with that. But I, you know, or you come to me, I'll just send you to tech transfer. So I always tell folks, go to tech transfer, because a lot of times, you know, they'll work it out with you. Question? Yeah. Uh, at, when it comes to the trademarks like Nike and Tiffany's, mm -hmm. at best, how do you know whether or not you're infringing on their on their trademarks, and at worst, how do you know how close you can come to basically just copying their design without getting into trouble? Uh, it's likelihood of confusion is the test. So, well, a couple of things. So trademarks, you know, it's not like, you know, there's what's called, uh, like, or, so, so for example, like, you can utilize Nike's trademarks, I mean, or Google or Apple, because if you like write a review of like an Apple product, for example. You're like, oh, I love the new Apple Watch. It's great, it's low, it's great. You're gonna utilize their marks, but it's with uh, it's within nominative fair use because you're describing the actual <coughs> product from Apple. Uh, so that type of use is fine. How close, so you're asking though, it's like how close could I come to like, for example, the Nike swoosh? It really comes down, the test is likelihood of confusion. Would someone think it's the same swoosh? Now, that's the standard of law. The standard that will be applied by Nike and Coca-Cola if you have a swoosh check mark and it's on an athletic apparel or athletic good, you will likely hear from Nike. Because trademark law rewards trademark owners who are aggressive at defending the mark. Like for example, Coca-Cola. Like if you put Coke or Coca-Cola on anything, you can probably measure in microseconds the amount of time before you're gonna hear from Coca-Cola's attorneys because they vigorously police their mark. You know, I mean it's and so really their standard is going to be really, really broad. So they're going to reach out to you and try to protect. And you just, you, a lot of times you can work out like a negotiated settlement. All right, we're going to change it a little bit. 
you make it make it clear we're not Nike, and they'll leave you alone usually. Okay. So kind of going on along with that that same premise. Um, on iDrive, you see all these um, places that have like cheap Disney like T-shirts, but it's not actually Disney licensed oh, yeah. products. How are they able to get away with it? Oh, uh, it's just counterfeit. It's oh. just knockoff. They're just using the marks illegally. Uh, like if you want to do Disney mer like if you want to do Disney merchandise, if you want to do a Chevrolet merchandise with the Chevrolet logo or the Ford logo, any of these. Uh, brands that are really popular for like accessories uh, there's a clearinghouse you go to like there's basically companies that administer the licensing so Disney has a whole licensing program for that like, if you want to make like a Disney like Mickey Mouse toy oh yeah there's a whole procedure for that you can go to them you get a license you pay Disney a nickel every time you make something and you get the officially lo authorized Disney logo on your product but it's so much cheaper to do it illegally, so a lot of people will do that. I mean, it kills your margin because Disney uh, and the license holders are going to want a generous portion of your profit. So a lot of people will just make knockoffs. So, you know, Canal Street, you go to Canal Street, right? And, uh, you know, you'll see like the Chanel and the, uh, uh, the, the Fendi bag. Yeah, yeah, that are like 20 bucks. We all know, you know, those are counterfeit. We all, oh, it's interesting. No one is actually, the consumer is not confused. You know it's not a Chanel bag. You know it's a, it's a fake Chanel bag. You know that's not coming from Chanel or Louis Vuitton. But it's technically counterfeit goods, trademark and fridge. But it gets a little dicey there. But it's, it's not dicey, it is illegal. But it's, it's an interesting question that, you know, folks have, have heard pose is saying that, you know, there is no confusion. I know it's fake. When I buy a Rolex for $45, I know it's not a Rolex, okay? I'm not dumb, you know? But it's still a, it's an infringement on the Rolex trademark because it's a it's a less a lower quality product with their mark on it. So that's part of the reason why it's protected in the trademark law. So that how they get away with it? They're just operating illegally. Eventually, Disney might find them. You know, just oh, well, here's another great one. Uh, anyone familiar with ASCAP? Yeah, I, I forget. I actually don't know the the, full, the the acronym off the top of my head, but basically, it's a licensing entity for live music. So, if you go and perform live music, like covers, you need to have an ASCAP license, which is basically this clearinghouse of rights for public performances of, of, of copyrighted songs. If you don't, it's a big problem. And you'll actually see a sticker on some establishment saying, "Oh, we're ASCAP approved. We play quality music here." A lot of people don't get the ASCAP license, and they have these guys, these investigators, that'll go to bars and like, oh, let's wait for them to play the cover song. Oh, here's the cover song. They're playing Sting. They don't have an ASCAP license. The next day, they'll get like a demand letter saying, uh, demand letter saying, you're, uh, you're you're infringing the copyright of these songs. We give in five grand or ten grand. Go count the number of times and, uh, and ask for statutory damages. And so they they basically shake down a lot of bars. So you see a lot of bars stop performing music because they don't want to pay the ASCAP license, which is like a, I can't recall what it was just most recently, but it's substantial. It's not like a $30 a, uh, $30 a month, something like that. For example, you'll see places playing Pandora, you know, live, uh, and pipe it through the system. You can't do that without an ASCAP license. You know, if they find you, they're gonna cause problems. That's why there's Pandora business, and there's like, you know, certain forms that are like designed for businesses, so you can do the public performance right. And those are much more expensive than like the regular Pandora one that you can subscribe to as an individual consumer. So that's all, a lot. Of, a lot of businesses play fast and loose with that because again, it's another reoccurring cost. They usually don't do anything until they hear from ASCAP or from somebody, uh, and they at that point they'll, they'll stop having music and uh, or they'll pay the fee. You know, so it's interesting. So it's again, a little, a little, uh, again, copyright is a big deal. Like whatever, and, and quite honestly, it's. It's pretty much pervasive, no matter I mean, because what business, how the business doesn't play music in the background. I mean, it's so you have to be concerned about these issues constantly, and uh, it's easier to nip them in the butt early on. Uh, so, any further questions, uh, or have I bored everyone? What about with like because books are copyrighted, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. What about pulling from like multiple books to create your own book? Oh, a compendium. So. That's a good question. Would it be original on its own? Would you need a license? 
I guess it depends on how much you're pulling. Like if you're pulling large sections, I'm sure the original owners are going to probably argue that you need a license from us to do this. It's just little snippets of quotes. I was going to say in your own words, maybe. Yeah, it's it's again, it's it's a gray area. How much of a change are you doing? Yeah, I know. It's like, it's, and then of course you can actually copyright a compendium, an assembly. If there's a, if there's enough original workman to, uh, uh, creativity in the actual assembly, you can actually get a copyright for that too. Question. Uh, so, like, I, I have a trademark on my logo. Uh, it's been out for about a year. Can somebody reproduce it and then trademark it out from under me? Mm, well, they can't stop you. Like, someone, let's say, for example, uh, someone in the state of Washington starts using the mark in the same area. And then two, three years later, you're doing really well, so you go to register your trademark federally. You won't be able to preclude them from operating in Washington. Whatever area they're in, they're going to have rights to. So they'll be grandfathered in. Yeah, they'll be okay. grandfathered in. You know, like Taco Tuesday is a great example. Everyone at Taco Tuesday, right? That's actually a registered trademark. Uh, there's a taco restaurant up in Minneapolis, I think, that has the rights to Taco Tuesday. And they're actually sending out nasty grabs of people. They're, they're, trying to, they're trying to bring back Taco Tuesday. Like, Taco Tuesday is ours. It can, but, I mean, it's used by everyone. If you want a flat to use Taco Tuesday, every place uses Taco Tuesday. And uh, so they actually had this really competitive, really aggressive campaign to kind of rein that in. So you might see Taco Tuesday go away. But Rachel, you have a question? Oh, no, I Can they really kill Taco Tuesday out of state like that? Like, all across? Well, they have a federal registration. They have a federal registration, and they have the, as I recall, they have the entire country except for an area. There was like a, there was a pre-existing user, a Taco Tuesday user in New Jersey, so they don't have like a certain part of like the Northeast. But other than that, the registration's valid, and they have it, and they're out there. I mean, they can harass you. I mean, you could, I mean, you could simply. Say, most people end up just stop using it. Because no one has basically said, you know what, I want Taco Tuesday. You guys haven't been policing your mark well enough. People are using it everywhere. So we're going to, we challenge you to sue us and we'll validate your mark in court. I mean, no one's taking it to that level. Everyone's just like, it's a, it's a special um, Tuesday. So it's, question? I mean, I would think they wouldn't be able to get rid of it completely because then they would also have to do with bad publicity if, say, they were like, oh, yeah, this elementary school can't do Taco Tuesday anymore. Then they'd be the jerks who took Taco I mean, no, yeah, no one associates it with this. For, I didn't even know they existed. You know, no one associates it with them. I mean, so they can only do it so much before people start thinking them as the jerks yeah, who are trying to I, monopolize Taco. So. I don't know what their game plan is, to be quite honest, on that mark. I mean, I think at this point, it's again, this way you gotta police your mark. You need to be out there like in the early 90s, like going after people saying, do not say Taco Tuesday. Although I would argue that a taco special on Tuesday is that's pretty darn generic and descriptive. So, I mean, it's like Meatloaf Mondays. I mean, come on. I mean, it's, taco Tuesday is descriptive. So, I don't think that mark would survive. They actually took it to court. I don't think that mark survives. I think it dies. You know? Jay, last one. Uh, this is a quick question. Do you copyright slogans? I, I know you went over that. Uh, slogans? No, that would be a trademark, trademark because it's associated with a product. But if, there's, if it's a stylized slogan, <coughs> there is a copyright in the actualized de the design. Okay. So you, you would actually, and that's the tricky thing, sometimes people will come up with a design for a logo. You want to make sure that, that the actual copyright for the design belongs to the company, and then you want to register the design and logo as a trademark. Alright, and with that, if there's any more questions, um, you can either ask Jack afterwards or he can uh, provide his email, but let's thank him for being here. Thank you guys. I didn't get, a, get a, a questions. Uh, there was a couple questions I could not answer, so email me those questions because I'm totally going to...